I'm about to study the incorruptible and errant word of God. I open my heart to God's message. I humble my mind to his wisdom, and I rest my hopes on his grace. I will accept its rebukes with repentance, rejoice in his truth by faith, and trust in his promises that can never fail. I can be what it says I can be. I can do, do. I can change what it says I can change as I trust in his grace and spirit. I covenant with God that I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to grow, and I'm ready to change as I hide his word in my heart and honor Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. What a privilege to be able to hide his word in our hearts. Children, you may be dismissed in, any, in the discipleship class. And uh, while you're being seated, if you're new with us, that declaration is something we've been doing here for about 20 some years, but it is our commitment to allow the Word of God to speak to us because it is not just a book. It is the inspired Word of God, written by the Holy Spirit through various instruments that he chose, prophets and apostles. Well, I hope you'll open your hearts and your minds as Pastor Steve comes. Pastor Steve, come and share with us what God has laid on your heart this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor Gary. Good morning, everyone. So good to see you. I always come up here with great fear and trepidation as I I'm stepping behind Pastor Gary, and I uh, feel like he's got more brains in his little finger than I have in my whole body. So I'm, I'm always uh, nervous to come up here from you guys receiving such great teaching. But I, I also know that uh, my wife spoke over me today. You've been anointed for such a time as this. I believe today is going to be a special day in your life. And so just pray with me for a moment. Father God, we just give you this time. Anoint me, Lord, as a speaker right now. Anoint us all as hearers of your word. God, birth in us a vision that we cannot shake. I plead with you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So today, like what God has laid on my heart is a sermon called Don't Sell the Farm. Don't Sell the Farm. I want to just open with a little story. This is from uh, the famous Russell Cronwell's uh, Acres of Diamonds speech. He says, there was a man living in Pennsylvania who owned a farm. And he did what I should do if I had a farm in Pennsylvania. He sold it. <laughs> but before he sold it, he concluded to secure employment, collecting coal oil for his cousin in Canada. They first discovered coal oil there. So this farmer in Pennsylvania decided that he would apply for a position with his cousin in Canada. Now you see the farmer was not altogether a foolish man. He did not leave his farm until he had something else to do. He wrote to Canada, but his cousin replied that he could not engage him because he did not know anything about the oil business. Well then, he said, I will understand it. So he set himself at the study of the whole subject. He studied the subject from the primitive vegetation to the coal oil stage until he knew all about it. Then he wrote to his cousin and said, now I understand the oil business. And his cousin replied to him, all right then, come on. That man by the record of the county, sold his farm for $833 and no cents. He had scarcely gone from that farm before the man who purchased it went out to arrange for the watering the cattle, and he found that the previous owner had arranged the matter very nicely. There is a stream running down the hillside there, and the previous owner had gone out and put a plank across the stream at an angle extending across the brook and down edgewise a few inches under the surface of the water. The purpose of the plank across the brook was to throw over to the other bank a dreadful looking, a dreadful looking um, scum through which the cattle would not put their noses to drink above the plank, although they would drink the water on one side below it. Thus the man who had gone to Canada had been himself damming back for 20 three years, a flow of coal oil, which the state geologists of Pennsylvania declared officially as early as 1870, listen to this, was then worth to our state a hundred million dollars. The city of Titusville now stands on that farm and those Pleasantville wells flow on. And that farmer who had studied all about the formation of oil sold that farm for $833 and no sense, and then he throws in, again, I say, no 
sense. He had none. He sold in a moment and created a quick buck when he could have had a legacy that he could have passed down an inheritance to his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So I want to share with you a sermon. I have, I have followed uh, Jenison Franklin for many, many years, probably 25 years, all the way back into high school when I read a book on fasting from him. And uh, I was just struck in my heart. And I have I've followed him pretty closely since then, many times. And uh, he preached a sermon once on a, a godly inheritance. I never forgot that sermon. And I have studied about it, I think, from that day. And it has become a huge just backdrop to my life of this is how I want to live my life. And so I want to use his um, text in that sermon for my text today. Listen to this. This is 1 Kings 21, verses 1 through 3. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden. Since it is close to my palace, in exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, listen to this, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. The Lord forbid. You know, Naboth comes on the pages of scripture right here in this text, but if you follow back his legacy, you find his heritage goes all the way back to a man named Manasseh, who was the eldest son of Joseph. I want to read to you, and I talked to my wife, and my wife said, you kind of lost me in the beginning of this sermon, so hopefully you can stay with me, because what I'm trying to do is show you the legacy and the blessing this man was coming from, okay? So this is a prophecy from Jacob, a man way, 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 way back, giving to his son Joseph, and it says this, that before he died, Joseph, or Jacob said this to his son, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. Do you hear this prophecy? Archers are going to attack him with what? With bitterness. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His arms remained limber because of the hand of the Almighty One of Jacob. Because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the sky above and blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and of the womb. Now, you see that his, one of his great, 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 great grandfathers is blessing his son and saying, you're going to be a fruitful vine. And yes, you're going to be attacked with these archers of bitterness. And boy, can you imagine? I mean, just sit down in this for a minute. You've been taken by your brothers, thrown in a pit to die. They decided to sell you. They tell your dad you're dead, right? You go and you live in this remarkable way and you're falsely accused. You're put in prison. You help these guys out and then they forget about, I mean, the, there's, endless, there's endless possibility. Can you imagine how many sleepless nights he had with the enemy attacking him with a spirit of bitterness? And Joseph says, I will not become bitter. I will become better by keeping my trust in faith in God at all times and believing that he has a giant meta narrative, this giant story that's overarching my story. And it's so big that he's working for me. And it doesn't matter who's working against me. It doesn't matter if it's my family members. It doesn't matter. God is greater. And he comes to this realization that whatever anybody else has done to him is not as great as what God has done for him. Now, it says that his influence will go beyond the walls, right? that he will be a vine that is fruitful, that grows up over these walls of bitterness. And what do you see? You see Jacob literally calling his brothers and giving them these beautiful places to live, blessing them, crying over them, all of these incredible things. And he goes back and overcomes all of this bitterness and, and the spirit of revenge and all of these things to just bless his family. And ultimately, you know what happened? He saved the very nation in saving his brothers he saved the very nation that God was going to use to bring Jesus Christ through that lineage. And you, it is, the rest is, is history. It's just absolutely beautiful. But Joseph was abused for 13 years and all that pain from his brothers, he's able to look at them and say, listen, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. And let me tell you something. If we're going to have blessings in our family, we are going to have to overcome the spirit of bitterness 
and our homes where, there are, where we're living together, there's, there's going to be a little friction, right? And forgiveness has got to be the foundation in a sense. Love is, is the foundation. But what does it do? Love forgives. That's what it does. It's its first response. It's its natural response. Jesus, while he's being killed, demonstrating the love of God to you and me. He's praying for those who are killing him. In that moment, in that very moment, that is, that's true agape love. When you peel it all back, you see that it's not dependent on how somebody else is treating you, but it's this power of God that comes through you to others to love in spite of type of love. So um, listen very carefully to me as I try to go through this quickly. I just want you to think about what are family fights about? What are family feuds about? It's Satan trying to get in to break up, I believe, this legacy that God has placed you within. So if whether the, the dysfunction and division is between a marriage or between grandparents or between family members, maybe your children, look at it from an eternal perspective and say, God, I want your, your kingdom and your blessing to be flowing down through the generations. And I don't want division. That's what Satan loves. Why? Because he says, one can slay a thousand, two can slay how many? 10,000. Where's the other 8,000 come from? From unity. The first verse of scripture that I put up in my boy's room was how blessed it is when brothers dwell in unity. Because there is where the favor of God, the oil of God, comes down running down Aaron all the way down on his beard and down on his, his, his uh, outfit, right? That priestly garments. It's the spirit of God. His blessing, his favor, his anointing, he says, is on there where there's unity. So I want you to listen. Joseph's eldest son is given to him by God. His name is Manasseh. Listen to what it means. It means to forget. Specifically, one definition is the God who causes me to forget the pain of my past. So God gives this son and he names him, hey, this is the God who helps me, right? He enables me to forget and say, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna maturate in this stuff that's happened to me. I'm gonna get into this giant meta narrative of what God is doing for me, that God is doing something amazing in my life, even though for 13 years, it's been, it's been terrible. God gives him a second son and he names him, listen, it's Ephraim. It means fruitful, fertile, productive, or doubly fruitful. Yes. Now, as you go back to Joseph's allotment, listen to this. The allotment for Joseph became, this is Joshua chapter 16, at the began at the Jordan. This is where God parted the waters. And when the priest went through, he said, not only am I going to bring you through here, but I'm going to take it all the way back. I've talked to you about it before, all the way back to a place called Adam and all the way to the Dead Sea. God is wanting blessing to flow, not just to you and for you to get where he wants you to go. He wants to cut back all the way to the genesis of the source of the problem and to break any curses that may be coming and see generational blessings flowing. So he says, any of the results of this sin all the way to the Dead Sea. And so these people walk through. This is where his property started. East of the springs of Jericho, that's where the walls supernaturally fell, right? And when he said, and went up from there through the desert into the hill country of Bethel. It went on from Bethel, that is Luz, as far as the region of Beth, lower Beth Haran, where the, this is where the sun stood still when Joshua prayed. And God says, okay, I'm going to listen to you. And I'm going to cause this and never before, never after, but today because you prayed. And he's right on this property here, right? right near where all this happened. So Manasseh and Ephraim, the descendants of Joseph, received their inheritance. Okay, you guys are gonna have to listen faster, okay? Here we go. The legacy of this property went back even further than Joseph to his father, Jacob. Listen to what Jacob did. Jacob had a remarkable dream at this place called Bethel. When Jacob awoke, he declared, listen to this, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob set up a sacred, sacred pillar, named the place Bethel, and consecrated the site as a place of worship to God. This is the place we're talking about. Jacob shares the significance of Bethel to J Joseph and adopts his sons in this passage. This is generation, or Genesis 48. And it says, Jacob said to Joseph, God, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, that was Bethel, that he renamed. 
in the land of Canaan. And there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful. Not only did jo Jacob prophesy over Joseph, but God prophesied to Jacob and says, I'm going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make your, you a community of peoples and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to who? To your descendants after you. Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. So Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. So there you hear the record of Jacob adopting Joseph's two sons, and they become two more, two more sons for J Jacob. And so you have the 12 tribes of Israel right there. Now I want to take you back quickly to the Garden of Eden. What does God do? He gives them this beautiful place. He creates Adam and brings Eve to him. And he says to them, over and over and over, as you're reading the account, he just talks about God blessing, God blessing the animals, God blessing the day, God blessing, God blessing, God blessing. And he comes to them and he says he blesses them and says to them, the first thing that he do, does is blesses them. I believe it's love's one of love's first responses. Not only do you create, you have this little child, Lord, I want you to bless my son in the name of Jesus. And God Almighty blesses the first family. But you see sin enters into that, that place. And what do you see? You see such a dysfunction and a curse comes on Adam that by the sweat of his brow, you see the ground is cursed. There's gonna be thorns and thistles. You see that Eve is cursed. There's gonna be pain in childbearing. You see all of this, the animals are cursed. They're gonna be eating one another now. This is crazy. Where did all of this come from? God had given them every seed-bearing plant, everything that bore a seed they could eat. There was only one thing that did not have a seed, and that was what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says, if it, if it wasn't this one, you can eat of it. So in my mind, I say, this one does, must not reproduce. It doesn't have any seed. Anything else, I can eat this watermelon. Say, Woo, thank you, God. And I can literally just have watermelon all over the planet because I can put those seeds back in and with just a few harvests, I can just have acres and acres and acres. That's the symbol of God's blessing. And if they had never eaten of this, can you imagine each generation as they take dominion would have been further and further and further and further away from that one thing that they had to eat of to bring curses in their life. That's what God is desiring, that it would be easier for your children to walk with the Lord because you've gone before them that it would be easier, that they could stand on your shoulders. That's what God is desiring, I believe. So listen to who these people were standing on their shoulders because God comes later to a man named Abram and makes a covenant with him. I want to read it to you in chapter 12. It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. If I had time, I would talk to you about the Chaldeans and how that's a representative of evil spirits. And, and how Gary, Pastor Gary has talked to us before about how the nations of the world were given to demonic spirits and things. He says, leave all of this and go to a land I'm going to give you for your own, right? Where you can show what it looks like to be in covenant with Yahweh. So he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. That's the mark of truly being blessed. Not ending with you, but that you are a blessing. So he says, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had commanded him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old. It's never too late. It's never too late. Some of you guys are sitting here, I'm, I'm coming to the end. Well, you might just be getting to the beginning. You just might be getting to the starting line right now of your journey of faith with the Lord, right? He's gonna do something mighty in your life. So it says here, he set out from Haran, from the land of the Canaan, and they arrived there at the time the Canaanites were in the land. And I just, I believe that there's, there's Canaanites in some of our land that God has said, this is where I want to take you. This is what I'm dreaming for you. This is what I'm prophesying over you. This is what I believe for you and what's going to happen. But there are Canaanites there. There may be some times that you're going to need to get on the ground and pray and say, God, please drive these Canaanites out. There's going to be battles that need to be waged, but he's going before you. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be an awesome testimony of God giving it to you. And when you get it, you'll know that you didn't, weren't the only one getting it. 
but that it was God's blessing and favor on you and that you trusted in his word. It says, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Not to you, but to your offspring. Hundreds of years later. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on towards the hills east of, listen to this, Bethel, once again, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So you see this man, Naboth, he has this vineyard and it's in this beautiful property that God says, Joseph, you're going to be blessed. Jacob, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be fruitful. And all the way to Abram. And he says, Abram, you're going to be blessed. And this is going to be given to your offspring. Go, back, go up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later. Here's this man living in this place. Where? Near Bethel. Which means, listen to this, the house of God. So, if you didn't track with me, you trace Naboth to a, to a tribe called Manasseh, who's the oldest son of Joseph. Joseph's father is Jacob. Jacob's father is Isaac. Isaac's father is Abram. And God just blesses and blesses. It says that Isaac, he, he literally sowed seed and God blessed them a hundredfold. You see blessing and fruitfulness being passed down all the way. Bam, 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 bam. And here's Naboth. You know what Naboth's name means? It means to sprout or to be fruitful. I think it's a prophecy over him that his fathers foresaw. This is what God has for you. This is what God has for you. This isn't just something that you, you happen to be good at digging holes and, and watering stuff and caring for it. This is something that is a generational favor being passed down to you. And Ahab comes to Naboth and says, hey, let me have your vineyard. Do you realize that Satan will come to you and he's gonna ask for your peace? He's going to ask for your joy. He's going to ask for your legacy of righteousness that maybe that generations before you have walked with the Lord and Satan is going to offer you all kinds of, I'll give you something greater in the present for this simple little piece of property. You'll have twice or three times as much. Ten times. What is it, what's it going to cost you? A hundred times? I don't care. He knows this whole thing is going down. So he's willing to offer us anything in the present to steal our legacy of righteousness. What others have done before us and that we're to be that link of blessing to the generations after us, if he can snap that. So think with me for a moment. The Mosaic law forbid the permanent selling of their inherited land. Why? Because the people saw it as what it was, a spiritual inheritance that God gave to Abram. And Abram passed down all the way. And now, all these hundreds of years later, here's Naboth and says, I'm not selling it was to remain in the family and never be permanently sold. You know about the year of Jubilee, I don't have time to go into it, but every 50 years, basically they rented their land in the 50th year, right? They got it back because they were never supposed to sell it. Do you realize that this very land that I'm talking about right now, Satan is fighting for this land and will all the way down to the, the battle of Armageddon. This land is a spiritual inheritance given to God's people because one man trusted God with his all his heart. What about your forefathers who trusted God? Maybe some of you say, that's not in my heritage. Maybe you're supposed to start that legacy today. That you say, I'm going to set my will. And I'm going to walk in a way that all of my descendants are going to be under favor generationally by God. I'm going to talk about it tonight. How when Abram, literally he reacts in fear over and over and over in his life. And you see generational dysfunction, all kinds of cycles coming out in his life and spiritual strongholds when he reacts in fear. But when he steps out in faith, generational blessings flow to his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and you're part of that blessing today if you're a follower of Christ because you've been adopted into the family of Jesus Christ, who he says the father of the faith in Hebrews is what? Abram. It's beautiful. I don't know if you're getting it or not, but it's incredible. So Ahab says to Naboth, I'm going to revisit one more time, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden. God compares in Deuteronomy 11, verses 10 and 11, he compares the promised land to Egypt, where he had brought them from. Listen to this verse, this is, these verses. For the land that you are in, entering to take possession of, it is not like the land of Egypt, from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it, like a garden of vegetables. What did Ahab say? 
I want you to sell me your vineyard, not to keep for a vineyard, but I want to put vegetables there like it was back in Egypt. You know, we're going to, we're going to have a vegetable garden where we sowed and where we irrigated it. Well, listen to this. I believe that Ahab wanted to symbolically take them back to Egypt. That was where God told them, don't ever return to. Don't ever go back there. That's where I've brought you from. But listen to the rest of the verse. He says, but the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from where? From heaven. This is going to be a blessed piece of property. You're not going to have to irrigate it and sow it and do all these different things like you did in Egypt. You're going to see my divine favor. I'm not saying there's not work involved. Okay, hear me right but you're going to see that you're moving in God's jet stream of blessing. You're going to sense his favor and anointing on your life. And people are going to be scratching their heads and kings are be coming to you and saying, I've got to get what they have because we can't get that with money or servants or more property. There's something that they have. And I want it. Satan wants that. He wants that favor of God. He wants that anointing off of your life. So you're walking powerlessly. He wants that. And you have to choose. I'm not selling it for any price, any price. So Ahab is trying to get them to go back to a place that's governed, instead of being governed by God, a piece of property that's simply managed by man. You know what Jezreel means? Listen to this. It means, this is, he was a Jezreelite. It means God sows. God sows. I take care of this for you. This property is, is watered by me. It's sowed by me with beautiful seed that's going to be a blessing to you and multi-generations after you endlessly. So their reign was promised by God to the Israelite nation if they were obedient. And you remember when Ahab turns from God through marrying Jezebel and she encourages him in wickedness and all this stuff, for three and a half years they're without rain. God is faithful to his word. He says, okay, I'm going to withhold the rain. So what does Ahab say? Well, we'll just, we'll create like it was in Israel. We'll irrigate our own stuff and we'll make sure that we have plenty of fruit. And he says, we're going to take the vineyard and turn it to a vegetable garden. Listen to me very carefully. Wine is representative of what? The spirit of God. That's what it is. You remember the, the spies go in? I say, this land is flowing with milk and honey. They're bringing jugs of milk and honey out, right? No. What are they bringing out? It just brings a land that's just flowing with God's blessing. But they bring out this huge cluster of grapes. Grapes is representative of wine, which is representative of God's spirit. And Ahab says, listen, we're not going to walk by the spirit. We can pull this off. We can sow this ourselves. We can irrigate this ourselves. We can take care of this. I've got thousands of servants. And in the end, we'll have these beautiful vegetables. And it says, that's not what it's about. It's about wine. If we don't have the spirit of God, we're nothing. We're nothing. We can't give up. We can't give up the vineyard. We can't give up the property. We can't give up the blessing that God has passed down to us. Is anybody with me? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay. So Satan tries to get us to settle. And he was saying we just settle for irrigation instead of the water of heaven, the rain of heaven. But we can also settle for just the water of the word and miss out on the spirit that is wanting to illuminate that word, wanting to make it live to you and have a rhema word in your heart that you know God spoke to you and that you step out in faith and says, God just called me on this journey of faith and I am moving out and generations are going to be blessed through my faith because God just spoke to me through his spirit and that word that he just illuminated in my heart and mind. That's what God is wanting. The Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If we just have a, just, just doctrine and we just have other things with no spirit, if God's not here, if he's not illuminating the word of God to you, if he's not opening your mind and empowering you to walk in it with faith and passion, then we just look like the Pharisees of old. We know a bunch of stuff. Right, But God is wanting to just break all of those shackles. If there's shackles on you, he wants to break them off and he wants to just be watered by heaven, like the dew of heaven, the water of the word, just fall on you and it gently. He's teaching you at night when you're laying down. When you wake up, he brings a passage of scripture to your mind and he just illuminates what it means for you and how you walk into that day and you sense his blessing and favor. 
That's what he's desiring. The Bible says, not by might, but by my spirit. By his spirit. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke, right? Whatever yoke might be on your family. We have this spiritual legacy. Listen to me. We have this spiritual legacy and the Nazarene movement that goes all the way back. Our church used to be called Nazarene Pentecostal because we realized that there was a, something that happened in an upper room with God's people that God told him right as he was leaving. He says, right after this, he says, go and remain in Jerusalem. Don't you dare leave, Pastor Gary. You did a wonderful sermon on Pentecost just the other week. Sharing about what happened in that upper room. Our legacy of power. Do you realize that we have forefathers that would walk in their shadows? People would get in, try to get in their shadows because they'd be healed. Handkerchiefs were being sent around because the power of God was on their life in such powerful, incredible ways. These are, this is our spiritual legacy because these guys remained. Peter had been so cowardly that just one person, just a little girl comes to him and says, do you know Jesus? And he's like, I don't even know him. He's going to deny him, renounce him. And then something happens in that upper room where he's completely purified and empowered. And he comes out and, pa- and speaks with passion to thousands of people and their hearts are melted and the church is birthed, boom, as Peter, this terrified little man, becomes this valiant warrior for Christ. And, and tradition is that he, when he's going to be crucified, he says, I can't be crucified the same way my Christ is crucified and ask to be crucified upside down. It's incredible legacy that we are part of. Do we just forget all of this? Or do we say, I'm not selling the farm. I'm not getting rid of all of this beauty that God has passed down to me and handed on me to, on a silver platter. So this legacy of righteousness and anointing through Pentecost. I don't know, this week I woke up when that whole story with the submarine going on, and I just felt like God was just, just I, when I woke up, these were the words in my mind. Steve? Because at that point, they were looking at the submarine. They were trying to find the submarine and saying, I don't know if the people have oxygen. They may be dying of oxygen under there and all this kind of stuff. And, and I was just thinking, this is what was in my mind the moment I woke up. You can be, I'm not diminishing the word, thank you, Jesus, for the word of God. But you can be surrounded by the word without the breath of his spirit, and you can die. I've watched it happen with people that know maybe hundreds or thousands of verses. They know a lot of right things about God, but the Spirit of God is not active in empowering them on the inside. They're not walking daily in His presence. And they're like the ten virgins. that They're virgins. They're not out having relationships with people they shouldn't be having, right? They're, they're not having a spiritual adulterous relationship, but they don't have the oil. They don't have the oil. The oil is just another representation of what? God's precious spirit. So we have to have both and. We have to have both and. I believe with all of my heart. So from Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. As the Lord is my witness, I will never give my ancestors inheritance to you. Have you ever done that? Have you ever drawn a line in the sand and said, I'm going to die here, but I'm not giving this up. I will not give this up. What happens? Naboth is falsely accused. He's brutally murdered, apparently along with his boys. You read it, 2 Kings says, Yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord. I don't have time to go through it all, but you see all the prophecies fulfilled from the curse that Elijah puts on Ahab and on his family. Ahab means, listen to this, The Hebrew origin means father's brother. Ahab had the potential to come over to his brother, one in the faith, his father, and say, man, I'm your brother. I'm going to put my faith in God too. I'm going to trust him like my father Abraham did and be a brother. But what does he do? He does exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. He marries Jezebel in English. Her her name means chaste or virgin. Hebrew origin meaning pure or virginal. Listen to what Merriam-Webster describes the name Jezebel as an impudent. I don't know why I'm having such a problem, but sameless or morally unrestrained woman. She dies, this wicked, shameless woman. 
If you know the story, Ahab looks like he's winning in battle, but it says someone pulls an arrow at random, eeny, meeny, miny, and God, like a heat-seeking missile, guides that thing right to Ahab. And he's standing there in his, his uh, chariot looking like he's winning, but he's losing. It's the same thing that has happened to Satan. He looks like he's winning. I promise his kingdom is coming down. And he's bleeding inside of all of this armor. And he's going down. And God says, I'm going to throw you to the pit. That's what's going to happen. We are going to be more than conquerors. We are going to be one day splashing our, blood, our feet in the blood of our enemies. And he says, we're going to be looking for him. And I'm going to be able to find him. Because with a word, he's going to destroy him with the glory of his coming. That's what's going to happen. So it's going to be awesome. So you see Ahab is prophesied and he dies. And where the, blood, where the dogs licked Naboth's blood, the dogs licked Ahab's blood. And then God anoints Jehu to go and, and to fulfill his prophecy. And you know what happens? Jehu goes and sees this woman who's more concerned with her eyelashes than her heart. And she's... She's beautifying herself up, getting ready to be thrown out of a window and trampled by horses and eaten by dogs. And they're inside having a meal and they're like, you know what? She was, she was the, the, the high priestess of Baal. We probably should honor her. She was the queen, you know? They go out to give her a honorable burial and they can only find exactly what the scriptures told her was going to happen. Her hands, her feet, and her skull. You look you follow the legacy of a man that could have been Abram's brother and his heart beating the same way. And you find that not seven of his sons, but 70, his entire legacy and dynasty, 70 of their sons' heads, his sons' heads were in baskets in front of two cities, if I remember correctly. It's a tragedy, an absolute train wreck. You see, listen to me very carefully. No sin is just about you or me. It is a wicked root that will grow up and produce all kinds of thorns and poisonous fruit in our own lives and very possibly the lives of our children. It ain't about a few minutes of pleasure. It's about Satan trying to rob future generations of blessing and being, bring curses up on them and invite evil spirits to pray up on them. Not to pray for them, but to pray up on them. What does God want to do? He wants to bless us. Satan wants to bring sin that ultimately turn to habits and addictions and strongholds and soul ties and, and all kinds of spiritual oppression and depression and possibly possession. And you're scratching your head saying, what in the world is going on? I know what went on. You asked one of these 70, 70 sons, what happened? What happened is go back. Dad thought it was trivial to commit sin. That was his attitude. We all have one. You have one and I have one. We have an attitude towards sin. What is it? If you realize that it hurts God's heart and you love him, it says a mere whisper can break a bone. That will be your heart on sin. See, I'm not about to sow a seed in future generations that could wreak havoc on my children and grandchildren multi-generationally because of my sin. Dad had his little pornography addiction. No big deal, nobody knows. God knows and he sees, he sees and he looks at strongholds and soul ties and all of these things at generations. You're like, what in the world happened? Somebody thought it was trivial to commit sin. That's what happened. That's what happened. I want to take you back to just a beautiful blessing because that's what God desires to do. As soon as he creates, I told you he wants to bless. It's the first response or one of the first responses of love that I see. He just wants to bless you. He tells his disciples, go to a home and bless it. And if it's worthy of your blessing, let it remain on there. Just go to them and bless them. Priests in the Old Testament were commanded to bless the people. We're going to pray a blessing over you today before you leave. It's a command of God. I'm going to have somebody very special pray over you today. <laughs> so God wants to bless us. Listen to this. God meets Melchizedek, I believe, as a pre-incarnate Christ, right? As Melchizedek comes and Abraham meets him. Listen to what happens. Abraham pays a tithe to him in trust that God is God his back. I'm in covenant relationship with God. I don't have to scrounge around and fight and rob people and try to out, you know, jockey my cousin or my, my nephew for property. I don't have to do all. I can step out of all of this game. And I can just say I can walk with God. He's got my back. He's got, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills. He owns the, the whole earth that the hills are on. I don't have to worry. 
And so he pays a tenth to Melchizedek and Melchizedek blesses him and pours out blessing on his son. Listen to this. This is a prophecy about Levi. To Levi and his sons, I give you all the finest olive oil and all the finest new wine and the grain they give the Lord as the first fruits of their harvest. All the land's first fruits that they bring to the Lord will be yours. That's Numbers 18, verses 12 and 13. Because his father had trusted God and God says, I'm going to bless you. I want to read to you just a few things that I was just studying this week about the people of God. This is what Genesis says specifically. I want to just give you one of his, a line from him. He says, every deed produces a seed for the next generation. And he talks about Levi right here. And he says, listen to this, that blessing was in his genes, in Levi's genes. You guys with me? It's a pretty good line. He says that blessing was in Levi's genes. Why? Because it had flowed down from, to him from his forefather, trusting God. It was a scrounging and scraping and all this kind of stuff. So a large percent of American millionaires, listen to this, are Jewish people. Although they're only 2.4% of the U.S. adult population, 30% of the wealthiest 100, and 140 of Forbes 400 are American Jews. How in the world does that happen? I'll trace back to, I believe, two things. That the Jewish people bless their children. And when they speak in authority by God, blessings come on them. But you can also trace it back to a man willing to leave everything and being blessed by God and being willing to trust God with his finances. He says, God, now, out for generations all the way to the end, I'm going to bless you. People are going to be scratching their head. I want to read to you, listen to this. This is crazy. Out of the 50th richest people in the world, around 25% of them are Jewish, and it's less than 0.2% of the world's population. How does this minuscule population have this massive amount of wealth? How does it happen? Trust. Get in a jet, God's jet stream of blessing. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, running over, men will heap into your bosom. I don't know how it happens. I don't even know what your bosom is, but it sounds good, right? That God's going to bless you. <laughs> Okay, come on, guys. All right. About one-fourth, listen to this. About one in four Jews, 23%, say they have a family income of 200,000 or more American Jews. By comparison, just 4% of U.S. adults report that level of household income. So here they are. We have this weird, weird discrepancy. I think a lot of this equality stuff is about Satan not wanting you to walk under God's favor. If you have a man that prayed for you and led you in your home, if you had a mom like I did that prayed for me in the middle of the night, you are standing on the back of all kinds of favor. God wants generations after you to experience the favor of God. And Satan also says, oh, here, no, no, we're not going to obey God. We're not going to trust him, but we want everything to be equal. Everything has to be, says, man, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your descendants after you if you walk in faith and everybody's going to be scratching their head what in the world is going on. And you can point to him. Luke 150 says, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. You see, one generation plants the trees, the next generation gets the shade or the fruit from those trees. I told the last service that there was a man who inherited this tree farm and his buddies were trying to get him to say, hey man, just cut all the stuff down. You'll be filthy rich. And he says, I am cutting down the trees that my great-grandfather planted. And I'm planting trees today that my great-grandson is going to harvest. I will not rape the land in my generation and not lay up for those coming after me what those before me have laid up for me. That's what God is desiring, that we would be faithful. So I want to talk to you real quickly, men, about your inheritance, and how do you pass it down? First, it's got to be a legacy of righteousness. You've got to be a person of integrity. I want to tell you one story. Listen to this. A Jewish boy who grew up in Germany admired his father. He practiced Judaism, and then they moved. When his father moved, he decided to change and go to a totally different place to start his worship, not because he felt like Judaism was wrong or something he changed because he said it would be good for business that was what he told his son 
His son, confused, bewildered, and angry for the rest of his life, he ended up moving to England, and in his writings, he described the religion as the opiate for the masses. He called everyone to live without God. He convinced a massive portion of the planet to govern according to doctrines of demons that came through his pen. His name was Karl Marx. The founder of the communist movement. The entire world was changed because one man put profits above principle, greed above God. He put the business reputation he had above his relationship with God and family and his son in the world has never gotten over it. One man. I'm going to talk tonight about the Esau syndrome, the Hezekiah syndrome, the Zedekiah outcome. I don't have time to go into it, but I hope some of you guys will come. Every father will leave a legacy. The only question is what kind will it be? A team of New York State sociologists, listen to this, set out to find the level of influence of one man and his family on future generations. They researched two men who had both lived at the same time in the 18th century. Max Jukes, an unbeliever, a man of no principle, 1,200 descendants, listen to this, 440 lived in outright debauchery, 310 paupers and vagrants, 190 public prostitutes, 130 convinced, convicted criminals, 100 alcoholics, 60 habitual thieves, 55 victims of impurity, seven murderers that cost the state of New York an ungodly amount of money. Just one legacy. Then he looked, they looked at Jonathan Edwards, a pastor, theologian, renowned scholar God used to bring about the Great Awakening. He had 300 pastors, missionaries, or theological professors in his family. 120 college professors, 110 lawyers, over 60 doctors, 30 judges, 14 presidents of universities, numerous giants in American industry, three U.S. congressmen, and one vice president of the United States. Just one man's legacy. That's the power. I could talk to you about the legacy my father passed to me. It wasn't all that he wanted it to be. But I know this, my dad would rather lie than to die. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. My dad would go to work early. He would stay late. He would work through part of his, part of his lunch because he was afraid if somebody came up and talked to him. This is how conscientious my dad was. Well, I don't know. I, if somebody comes up and talked to me, you know, I don't want to cheat my boss. And so he would write down less time, get there early, stay late, and work through his lunch break just in case somebody talked to him, even the owner of the home that he was working on because he didn't want to cheat his boss. That's how... That's the legacy that was passed me that I look and say, my dad would have rather died than to lie. I would wake up in the middle of the night and my mom would be praying for me in the middle of the night. That's the legacy. I'm walking with favor on my life. Nobody can convince me otherwise. And my relationship with my beautiful bride, I have experienced just nothing but blessing because my mom, she prayed over me. I tried to get my dad to do it, but he wouldn't do it, but my mom did. And she prayed a blessing over our, our family. And I go back to it all the time and I say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for my mom's blessing. I thank you that you have blessed my home. You know what my mother-in-law, she would, she would fast every single week, every week for her daughters and prayed for her son-in-laws that she had never met. In other words, she invested way back here for me and for all the blessings that I have in my home before we ever even met. When I'm tempted greatly, I think, am I going to spit in my mom's face? Am I going to look Christ who died on the cross and descended down into hell for me? Am I going to spit in their faces, kick them in the shins, and go against everything? All the legacy of righteousness that had been passed down to me. You got to be out of your mind. There's got to be a line that we say, I ain't selling the farm. I'm not giving all this up. I've come too far. I love him too much. There's not, a, there's not a fiber in me that wants to give up or give in. I don't care what I'm offered or what I'm given. God can give you the grace to say no, just like he gave Naboth the grace. And even though he paid in the short term, God came to his defense. And when Satan tries to steal your legacy of righteousness, God will stand up when Satan comes in and tries to destroy what God is trying to guard and bless your family with. Are you hearing me? That's what God will do. I want to just give you one person. This is my father-in-law. George met 
Kathy in high school. They met because he was her dealer and then became her lover and ultimately had a child out of wedlock. He could have chosen to go ahead and say, let's just get rid of this little situation here and we'll just make it all go away. But he chose to marry Kathy and to be faithful. This is what his daughter was the fruit of that relationship. She said, I owe him my life because of the teenage young man and senior in high school, he embraced responsibility for an unplanned, planned pregnancy. That has always been someone we can count on to be there in a moment's notice for any and every life situation. He is a living example of what is a true man of God, a husband and a father is. My dad faithfully stands by his woman and daily shows how much he loves her. This verse came to mind as I was trying to pick a few things to mention about dad. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole earth would not have room for the books that would be written. John 21, 25b. She said, every day I'm proud to call him my father. I love you. Mi papi padre. <laughs> she said, he's a, a, a man of hilarious one-liners. I'm going to try to stop crying here. Like, stop the planet. I want to get off. And a man can't live on bread alone. He needs ice cream. John said, he set the bar high for what it means to provide. He provided for a family of eight on a single income. His daughter, Michelle, said, I get to have two perspectives with dad, not only as my dad, but as my boss. Anyone who works with him has nothing but praise to say about him. Anybody who talks to him always walks away a better person as an employee or as a person. The main thing that sticks out to me is how consistent he is in what he says. He's always been a man of his word. He is the same man at work that he is at home, full of integrity, compassion, and always wanting what is right. He leads by example in his actions and not just his words. Brian, his other son-in-law, said, George's generosity is near the top of my list. He truly believes that his money is the Lord's and, he, and, and lives like it. He likes having his possessions, home, car, office in excellent condition, which inspires people and blesses them. He doesn't hoard what God has given him. Instead, he uses it to build into the lives around him. Joe, one of his adopted sons, who literally, I'm going to tell you the story, when he was adopted, he asked George for a bicycle, and George told him, we don't have money for a bicycle right now, because they were barely scraping by. So George went and prayed, and within two hours, God provided this, what Joe called, a miracle bike of bicycles that God brought to their home. Somebody did not know anything about the situation and just happened to show up <laughs> with the bicycle for his adopted son. He says, my father was a titan. He made sure I was taken care of and he helped hold my soul up to God. There are no words for a man like this. Sonia, his adopted daughter, he chose me. He fought for me and won. When she came to their home, she would only bond with George. And George was working for hours away and he would drive two hours both ways, one hour stand, to get back even though the, his work would rent him a hotel. He would drive home four hours to be with his little adopted daughter. Kathy said, in a world that has demeaned a stay-at-home mom, George has always been my cheerleader, making me feel like I was doing the most important job in the world. He has a heart for missions and serves on the mission board. He took all six of the kids to DR, as well as myself and numerous grandchildren on mission trips. He just took two of my kids to Israel. It just goes on and on and on. George is one of the hardest workers I know. He's respected at work and at home, but he's never put work before his family and numerous times has dropped everything to care for us. I remember when we were on, um, there it shares, I'm sorry, this is about the story about the bicycle. Just incredible. I'm going to tell you. George not only said, okay, by the grace of God, I'm going to be a godly husband. I've messed up. I'm giving my life to Christ. We're going to, as a family, follow the Lord and then support three children and then foster over a dozen children, then adopt three children, then over 24 grandchildren God has blessed him with. I see him just pouring out on his family. And I see these generation after generation after generation of blessing flowing down to us 
and Satan wanting to cut it off in your home and in my home. But this is the fruit of just what I'm, I'm just a little part of what I'm walking in right now. Are you guys with me? I'm experiencing the favor and blessing of God on my life because of people that made right choices in the past. And God wants that to flow to every single one of us. God is a God of blessing. So part of the blessing I feel like I'm walking in right now is from my precious mother, who I wake up in the middle of the night, like I tell you, and she'd be praying over me. And so I'm gonna have her come up here and pray a little blessing here in just a minute. Ryan, if you would come up and just give us a little music, that would be awesome. I want to just give you a couple last little things here. It says, a righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. He leaves an inheritance for his children's children. This isn't just, just an inheritance of finances. If you give your kids money without God, it's going to be the thing that destroys them. But if you pass down a legacy of love for God and faith in him and walking with him, oh, we have to come to a point where we say, as Joshua did, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We ain't selling the farm. We ain't selling the farm. Don't forget the mic up here. I want to end with one verse, and then I'm going to call you forward. If you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, this is Malachi 2, 2b three, to 3a, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. What is God saying? He's saying, listen to me. We are in a cosmic battle here. We are in this cosmic battle. You can't just walk nonchalantly saying, I haven't really chosen sides yet. I'm going to figure out who I'm going to serve. No, you got to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He says, if you haven't figured that out, if you haven't set your will to seek him and to honor him, he says, there's already a curse of apathy on your home. You're missing out on the blessings of God that God wants to give you generationally. And so today I'm going to call you guys to go all in. If you're not all in, today could be that day where maybe you move. If maybe your, your legacy is messed up, God gives you the privilege to pick that home up and come over all the way over and say, let me come over here on my father Abram and let me set it down right here. I'm going to be a man that trusts God. I'm going to be a man faithful with my finances, faithful with my eyes, faithful with my heart, and I'm going to leave a legacy of righteousness. That's what God wants. So your family, multi-generation can be blessed and everything can, can change today. That bitterness has kept you apart from family members can be done today. You can just let it go. Say, Father, I'm releasing it right now. This distrust, this division, this despair, whatever it is that maybe has been passed down, I've seen it illustrated. I want it broken and I want to go right to the source of true joy and true peace and contentment and all these things that I want them passed down multi-generationally.